The living legend. How you feeling, brother? Man, I'm great, man. Can't complain, man. Beautiful day in the A. Yes, sir. What's up, Bone Crusher? Salute. Good, <laughs> I'm going to get right into it. I'm gonna get right into it, bitch. Dog. How does it feel to be a living legend? Oh man, I don't know about that part. I'm just here. No, bro. I gotta give you your flowers right you here. You're a living legend, man. You got the whole world saying we ain't never scared. It's a song that's gonna stick from generations to generations. We pass it down. You are the Grammy nominated artist, bro. How does it feel? Oh uh, man, it feels good, man. I mean, you know, the thing about it is that um I don't really get into the, all that stuff. I just get into the energy of making sure that I enjoy myself in the moments of every moment that I'm living. I want to make sure that people understand that I don't really care about accolades and none of that stuff. I just care about the music and what I, what me and the music can do to make people feel a certain kind of way when I leave the studio. Truly. So when you was in the studio and this beat came on, can you take us back to that moment? What was that feeling like? Um, I remember Avery had called me doing the Avery Johnson did the beat. He had called me and asked me to come over. And ironically, I had no money then, so I had no way to get there. But he lived two doors down from me, two houses down from me. I just walked down there and uh, he was like, yo, man, I got this beat. Tell me what you think of it. Maybe we could do something on it. I said, bet. So he put the beat on, and I had wrote the hook on another session with the Young Bloods that I didn't use on that session. But the hook fit that beat better. So I was like, yo, it made me change the way the cadence went on in and everything. So I started singing it like that. Outside of the club, and think I'm a ball. And the beat driven me, drove me that way. So it was crazy. And I leave my burst the same day, and the rest is history, bro. Then I got T.I. to come. Ironically, once again, T.I. was right around the corner at uh, Mac, Mac Boney's uh, auntie's beauty salon. They had a studio in the back. And I went and got Tip. Tip was sick. He's like, yo, man, I'm sick, man, but I shit. Let's, let's do it. So I went and got him, brought him to the studio. That, that flow that you hear that he has now came from that sickness and that the case that the way he rapped on Never Scared, that whole vibe, the whole trap thing and all that shit, that the way he's delivering his stuff now came from from that session, which is ridiculous, right? And even with Killer Mike, all that just all came together in a way that was just really dope, man. But the way I felt off the record, and the way that beat, when that beat dropped, bro, man, it's crazy. It was a great marriage between the percussion of the drums and the snare and the groove of the bass line and my percussion, which is my voice, right? It was a marriage that cannot be reproduced, just to be honest with you. The way that the way that Avery mixed my voice, the way Avery and Billy Hume mixed my voice in that song, man, come on, man. Ain't wow. nothing like it. Not at all, nothing coming close. And you lit a fire with that record in the world. Like you lit a fire up on the TI and his career during that time, the energy that that record brings. And just, uh, you know, just for the South in general, at the beginning, you was popping it. What, it didn't, when you heard it, did it just come about you like that or you had someone on your mind? Um, I was going through a lot then, man. I was broke, like I said before earlier. My kids needed food. I just feel like, that beat was the beast for my psychological release on the world. Just talking about what I felt at that moment, the pain, the passion, the love, the, the turmoil, the everything I was feeling came out in that hook and that beat, man. And, you know, my whole album was like that. My whole album felt like that too, because, you know, 
we never got a chance to explore the whole album because Arista was going through what he was going through as far as with BMG and the split and all that. So I got kind of caught up in that shuffle of after Never Scared. I was very thankful that Never Scared got his shine because it probably wouldn't have worked either because of the thing that was going through with that whole turmoil with the label. But the whole album from beginning to end, even from Never Scared all the way to The Wall, and The Wall was a record talking about the way I feel about world, about the world, humanity, how I saw things and how we got to come together as a community. People never got to experience that side of me from that album, but I've been talking about and living that life since I was a little boy and raised to be that way. And, and, and the energy of all that was released on Never Scared and throughout the Attention album. So, you know, I think that, uh, to answer your question, I think that that, that beat and that groove is timeless because I'm always real with myself and I'm always real with the fans. I'm always real with who I am and how I'm gonna deliver myself to you. So I'm never gonna put myself in a position to where I'm not being real with me and with what I'm giving to people and the way I share my, my love and compassion and drive and energy and turmoil and love and the way I drive and all that. If I that's going to be me forever. So, you know, I just, I just think that people will get a chance to meet that side of me next year when my album drops and they're going to see the whole thing unfold. They're going to get to see all the pieces that they didn't get a chance to enjoy and involve themselves with from a fan base and from a love space on my next album. What's the title of the album? Um, it's called the return of the lyrical giant. Yeah. And then the LG, the lyrical giants is a group that I'm in that I, I was a one third member. It was me, Cotton Mouth and Visa. And the lyrical giants were very pivotal in the, the infrastructure and the making of the sound of Atlanta in the beginning. Right. That's after. The, the originators, which means uh, Shadi, Raheem, Mojo, Hard Boys, uh, Ghetto Mafia, you know what I mean? The list goes on and on and on. Hit with J and the J team. After them, then the LGs were pivotal in the underground scene of Atlanta. And um, I had to give props to my brothers. So I had to rename the album because that's the essence of who I am in the beginning to let people know where I really stand, right? So, you know, when I got on, I made sure, this goes back to who I am as a person. I made sure that my boys were put on. I didn't leave them behind. I made okay. sure that Visa got a deal at Def Jam. I made sure my boy Cotton, I said, Cotton, man, you wanna get a deal? Let's get a deal now, right? He was like, nah, man, I don't wanna do no deal, man. I just better just be, you know, I just wanna go on the road. I said, bet. He was right there. So he was right on the road with me. He went, he's a hype man for me. He just did whatever. Yep. We, we toured the world together. We, 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 we filled up passports together, right? So Great. that's always been my thing. I always try to make sure that me, not just me personally, but everybody around me is eating, right? That's what it's about. We as brothers can just learn how to connect each other and make sure everybody around us is eating so we can have great times together. I don't want to be the only one at the table breaking bread. I want everybody to break bread together. That in turn makes us a stronger unit and a stronger brotherhood. So, you know, that's why I named the album that. I named the album The Return of Lyrical Giant for that reason, man. I got production for some of my best friends in the world. Uh, DJ Tool produced on there. Jazzy Faye produced on it. Um, Magneto produced on it, 80 Empire produced on it from Canada. Uh, and it's, it was a, it's a testament to who I am as a person, the type of things that I'm on and always. And every moment on this album is going to give you the same nostalgia and euphoria that Never Scared gives you right now.
That's tough. Uh, I'm going to bag it up a little bit. You know, the world of up north, I take it to, you know, New York, that region. They think of Busta Rhymes and Spliff Stars, that tag team rapper hype man combo. But for me, growing up in the South, watching you and Cottonmouth bring that same energy, show after show, taking them shirt, I was going in the crowd, and it just becomes contagious. So when you brought them up, it took me back to a time I was like, that was it, bro. It was Ben Glory. Right. right. You know what's so crazy, man? Me and Buster Rhymes did an album. We started doing an album together called King Kong versus Godzilla. We never finished it. But uh, we was on a roll together on a Rock the Mic tour. And I would come out on Buster's set and do Never Scared the Remix and Never Scared with him. And 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 one of the one of the biggest compliments I ever got in my life as an as an entertainer is when Buster Rhymes told me that, yo, Bone, man, you and your you and your fat homeboys like, ooh. Y'all like me and Split. I was like, yo, that is the biggest compliment ever, bro. I appreciate it, man, because your stage show is crazy, bro. Like, Buster's stage show is epic, right? And for him to say that me and Cotton was a mirror image of him and Split was just kind of like, you know, that was everything to me, man. And, you know, I look up the great entertainers, bro, and I, I pat my show off the great entertainers and giving people the energy and the power and the and then, you know, giving it to them on a real way and just having a good time and enjoying the moments that make the crowd go crazy and make them feel good when they leave and have something to talk about. Truly, and every time you hit the stage, man, it brings that energy and, and it just lights us up. Do you ever get tired of hitting the stage? Say it again. I said, every time you hit the stage and perform your records, it goes up. The energy is contagious. But do you oh, ever yeah. get tired of doing it? You, I think that has a lot to do with the honesty of the approach of the record. The honesty and the energy in that record was about a bunch of broke brothers from Atlanta and from the world that had a common interest in order to get themselves out of a situation the right way and to be able to, with passion and with drive, take the world on in a way that nobody knew about us. So they didn't see us coming, so they couldn't prepare for it. And when it came out, it was like a storm, like, Whoa. like what is this? This is crazy, man, you know? So it became, and still is, probably one of the biggest records of all of us. You know, it is because of it'll never be duplicated. You know, a bunch, three guys that nobody knew come out on a record that takes their careers to whole places. Ain't nobody doing that, man. Just to be honest, yes. man, nobody, ain't nobody doing that. Not at all. So, man, I remember uh, a while back, Def Jam put this video game out. Uh, Might have been the Def Jam Vendetta, the fighting game with all the rappers, right? right? I believe that was the first and the last. You're part of that history, dog, and your signature move on there, you just be like, oh, Tinch, oh! <laughs> how did you come back. up with this title? How did, how did you come up with that attention title, bro? What does that uh, stem from? Um, You know, I've been saying attention since I was a kid. And it covered me fighting. You know, I was going clubs, talking crazy. Get on! Just, just acting crazy, just whatever. And then I'll start fighting or whatever, man. It, 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 it's, I took that negative side of it and made it and just start using it. And I don't even know where it came from, to be honest with you. Um, it just in me. I don't know, man. I say all kinds of stuff, but that one particularly stuck. Yeah, and um, I think that one of the first times I ever used it on a song was on the uh, the uh, action remix with uh, with Killer Mike. No, 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 no. With no, the uh, I'm serious remix with uh, Pastor Troy and Ti. I'm getting serious, man. You know yep. that was probably one of the first times I ever did it on record. Um, and it was an honor to do that too because that was um, that was with my brother Pastor Troy and with Ti. So that really, you know, it just came out. And I think uh, KP 
was in the studio and I had did it. He was like, yo, that's it. We're going to use that right there. I was like, all right, cool, bet. So we just started using it. So I was like, man, this is it. So I just started using it all the time. And I would say it in every record almost back then. And it was so much that JD was like, we should just name the album Attention. You know what I mean? Attention. And I was like, all right, bet. He said, we're going to spell it. A T T E N C H U N N N N. I was like, oh, okay, cool, whatever. I don't care. And um, yeah. it, it became this whole vibe, and everybody loves that shit, man. Like when I say it, it makes the club go fucking bananas. So when it goes, that bananas, that. I'm like, well, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Because I like it all, man. I, I tell artists that I, I, I mentor and work with, I say, man, I'm biased to everything that I do because I like all of it. So you telling me that this one particular thing that I made that I like, you like that, that works for me too. Cause I like that too. So it's not like you telling me to do something that ain't me. So it makes sense to me. So attention has just always been this starter for me, man. Attention! <laughs> Whatever the beat is, man. I get young artists all the time, man. He just say that to me. He said it to me, dog. I'm like, yeah, man, I charge you to send it to you, but hey, uh, hey, I'll send it to you. So I got that thing on, on go at all times. Truly. Did you uh used to use your own character on that game when you played it, or did you use anyone else? No, they used me, man. It's crazy on, on the Def Jam game. I flew to New York, and um, they shot me at all different angles, right? Then they gave me a script of words that, that I wrote that they wanted me to say. So then I made up some stuff. You will be destroyed. You will be destroyed. <laughs> that shit there. I've been doing that for years, bro. I, I, you know, it comes from me watching a lot of wrestling when I was a kid, bro. Like Hulk Hogan and Macho Man Randy Savage. And, you know, it's just, that's, that part of me is uh, always don't be there. All right, cool. So you said they had you do the script and you was uh, into the Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man Randy Savage. You was watching wrestling, bro. I'm listening. Yeah, I man, I used to watch wrestling all the time, man. So that 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 uh, that played into my whole persona as an artist, too, because I would do imitations. I talked like Hulk Hogan, Ronald Reagan, Kermit the Frog. And, you know, I would do that for years, bro, when I was younger. Jesse Jackson, whoever was hot at the time. I just, you know. I, I would do imitations, and, and I've always been this fun-loving, crazy dude, but that part of me came out in my artistry, too, as Bone Crusher, um, and on the game, where I would be, like, acting crazy, all these voices, all this animated stuff, and it just, it just, it was an amazing experience, bro, um, to be on that game, and, you know, I was on a cover of PlayStation Magazine, too. Out of all the characters on there, they chose me as one of the characters to be a representation of the PlayStation for the game, uh, for, for the uh, for the magazine, which is really dope. Yes, it is. How did you come up with the name Bone Crusher? Oh, uh, it was given to me. I'll just draw your own conclusion for what it was given to me for. Um, I just took that and made it into a you know, into the lyrical side of it. And I said, yo, that'd be a dope name to use as an artist. And at the time I was real crazy. So I was like, yo, it'd be real intimidating too to use my to use my street name as a rapper. You know what I mean? But you know, I ain't never, I tell people all the time, I never sold dope a day in my life. I don't know nothing about dope. I don't know about none of that shit. All I know how to do is fight. I've been a thug all my life. So, you know, I fight. I don't, Man, I don't know nothing. I, I'm the type of guy going to in the party and tear the club up, tear the party up, fight the whole party if I can. And I, yeah. I don't care about nothing else. But that was old, old dubby back when I was a kid. But now, you know, I've taken that bone crusher persona and name and used it for my artistry and who I am as a person, which means that 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 persona of the energy, the power, the essence, the groove, the, the love, the, the strife, the, the everything is who I am. And now I'm presenting Bone Crusher as another brand, another person 
to people on the world where they can say, well, shit, man, I've been through some of them similar things that has made me become who I am today. And everybody goes through something to become something else if they get smarter and they grow up and become a grown up. And I was, I was very privileged to become a grown up in the whole process of this, of my industry, you know, industry and in invite, if you will. I like to say invited because they can uninvite you that you ain't never gonna get back in. But the fact that I was, I'm still on the invite list uh, yes. means a lot to me as an artist. And, you know, Bone Crusher is who he is, you know what I mean? I am who I am, you know, that's me. Uh, I've never, I never wavered from who I am as a person and I never will. So I'm always be me. I'm always going to be the energy of life, liberty, and the pursuit of greatness and happiness, you know, like, like an American slogan. But uh, um, it's just all about the essence of uh, love for me now. Self-love, compassion, boundaries, how to, con how to convey great messages to people around the world. And you'll see that in the, in, the, in the Lyrical Giant album, how I've grown as an artist. And I'm gonna show people the lyrical side of me along with the energy that you didn't get a chance to experience on a 10 John. I'm definitely gonna download that album, man. Uh, we're spending that first quarter, second quarter next year. Third quarter, fourth quarter, fourth quarter. Fourth quarter. All right, perfect. Third quarter, time. third quarter, third quarter. Okay, good timing, good timing. So uh give you a back history of me, man. I'm originally from Columbus, Georgia. And okay. I worked at a radio, I, I worked at a radio station called Foxy 105 down there. And uh shout out to my dog DJ Double O Key. But to this day, in the year. If you go to Columbus, Georgia, the Afternoon Drive show is titled The Van Glorious Show because of you. What? To this Van day Glorious. in 2020. That's crazy. Honestly, Bone, on, on everything. That's my hometown. I go there three to seven. It's The Van Glorious Show. How did you come up with this word, Van Glorious? You know, I, I can't take credit for that. Once again, I'm a student of the game, a student of hip hop. And I got that from Professor X from X Clan. And wow. he, that whole group, man, back in the day, X Clan, Public Enemy, KRS One, uh, Rock Kim, Run DMC, those guys had such a big influence on me that I would, I would emulate and try to be as good as they were, as still as they, as they are in the game. And I would study X Clan, man. If you never heard of X Clan, if you never listened to their music, they shit is jam. And uh, right. Brother J, Professor X, um, I got that from them. Just to be honest with you, because he was saying, yeah. "Van Glorious, this is protected by the red, the black, and the green, with the key, sissy." I got that Van Glorious from. Professor X, man, shouts out to the great Professor X. That's dope. You took that and you passed it along to someone like me, dog. So salute, bro. Because of you, now I got the backstory. <laughs> hey, man, that's, that's hip hop, though, man. We gotta, we gotta learn how to respect and and give our props to those that help us get to where we're supposed to be. And truly, hip hop is hip hop has a a very weird way of exiting out greatness from the past, which don't make any sense to me. I never thought that way. Even when I was on top of the world, I will always give my props and my love to the great ones before me. And, and that's something that is missed now in hip hop. And I think it should come back that where we as the young, the younger artists should give props to the, the older artists and the older artists to reach out and give love to the new. That's real, man. Much, much respect on that. Bone Crusher, getting you ready for the new album, The Return of the Lyrical Giant, next mm -hmm. year. We were in the studio, and uh, me and my executive producer were having a friendly battle of ATL's music genres, and we took uh, crump and bass, put them against each other. And in the crump era one, I must ask you, when we speak the crump era ATL, you are the flagship. You're there. You're on that Mount Rushmore. When we say crump music, Mount Rushmore, there's Bone Crusher. How impactful was that movement when it hit the world? Um, it was 
it was everything. It was everything, I tell you. Um, you know why it was so pivotal? From, from Three Six Mafia to Lil John to me to some of the other participants in that era. Um, because what made it so dope was that it was a whole South thing. It wasn't just an Atlanta thing. South. It was a South thing. So everybody from the South was on the same mission. And everybody was working with each other. There was no animosity. It was all love. Everybody was jumping on each other's records. And I knew it was piv it was really crazy when we got that source cover. A lot of yep. young people don't understand the, the importance of that cover because yes. that source cover was every source was everything to hip hop back then. And it yes. meant so much for us to get that cover because at at points in the history of hip hop, they would not give Atlanta or the South any kind of props for anything, right? You know, Luke, Luther Campbell and um, the whole uh, Skywalker Records, they did so many great things for the South and they didn't get props. Two Live Crew, man, Poison Clan did a lot for the South and didn't get props. They did big numbers. The South movement for Crump, the reason why it was so big was because, back to what I'm saying, we all did it together and it's hard to kind of stop the force of nature like that. And everybody was looking for something to grab hold to back then because of the of the terrible of the terrible beef. Hello? Him? Oh, of the terrible beef between the East and the West Coast, right? And the and the tragic deaths of our great brothers Pac and Biggie. People were looking for something to grab hold to and the South was coming in with all this harmonious joy and crunk and having a good time and enjoying the club. And, you know, that part of it, I think is what made the crunk movement as strong as well, is that it was, it had the, it, it, had, it hit the industry in a moment where it was very open to something that had to be about upliftment and love. And I remember that article in the source, when the writer of the source magazine, the, the editor of the set magazine, she said that the reason why the South is winning, and I'm paraphrasing, the reason why the South is winning is because of their unity. The unity is what we would love about them. And I remember going down through Times Square and it used to be a store called the Virgin Mega Store where they actually sold CDs and you know vinyl and tapes back then. And it was like 03, 04. And uh, I looked up and it was a big picture of me on, in Times Square. And across the way was a big picture of Lil John. And I was like, yo, wow, that's crazy. And I didn't realize the impact of it until I looked behind me and it was people following me. And I'm like, yo, what's happening here? I don't get it. You know, so I, I dipped into the store. I dipped into the, the, the Foot Locker right there in Times Square. You, you, you know what I'm talking about in, in New York? You've been in New yeah, York? Yeah, yeah. Right yeah. there in Times Square. There's a Foot Locker right there. And I dipped in there. And I went in there like I was buying some shoes and I let everybody kind of go by me. So I said, well, fuck it, I'm gonna go over here. So I went to the Champs, uh, the Champs right there on the corner, 42nd and Bullock and Broadway. And I went in there and got me some sneakers and I came out. When I came out, I was just gonna walk back to the room, which is about three, four blocks up. So I'm going back. I said, I'm standing there. I'm like, man, man, this is real good. I'm still, I, I can still see the billboard out of my peripheral to my right. I'm like, yo, that's really dope, man. And um, across the street there, there's a subway let out right there. And the kids came out the subway. At the time, I'm number one on one six in Park with the number one song in the country. The only person bigger than me is 50 Cent, right? So they come out, and I'm oblivious to it because I'm not into this star stuff. People write their own narrative about you, so I don't really care about that. I don't care about the music stuff. I mean, the, the fame, I care about the music, but I don't care about the fame side of it. And the kids come out and they see me. And when they see me, I look at them. I say, uh-oh. And I hear one girl say, that's Bone Crusher. <laughs> they run across the street. And that corner is a very busy corner right there, right? And it is about 20 kids standing right there in front of me 
all around me, right? And I'm like, okay, okay. Can I get a picture? Can I get a picture? I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. So this cop comes up on a horse. He says, hey, man, I don't know who you are or what you're doing here, but if you don't get in a cab right now, I'm taking you to jail for disorderly conduct. I said, wow. man, I'm just standing here, bro. He's like, yeah, yeah I don't care, but you're causing a problem. And my traffic not moving. You got to go. I said, all right, man. So I get in a cab and I'm leaving. When I'm leaving, it's so surreal to me how big the crunk movement is becoming in New York City. I'm like, yo, yeah. this is crazy. <laughs> like, not even seven, eight years ago, they was calling us Bama and the South wasn't really nothing. You know what yeah. that proves to me? That good music doesn't have a jurisdiction. Yeah. Good vibes and good energy doesn't have any cubby hold on it. It doesn't have any boundaries around it. And I got myself in a space where I start to understand, to your point, how big the crunk movement was getting. Because I, I was in my own little bubble. Sure, I was doing all this stuff, but I didn't care about that, man. I was just on a mission. My mission was just to bring my vibe and music to people. I didn't care about the fame. I still don't. I don't care about that fame stuff. All I care about is that people get what I'm what I'm giving them, right? And the crunk movement, man, was just is just ridiculous. Like even if you play that some songs, any of them songs back to back, back to back, back to back, back in the club, whether it's Crime Mall, Lil Scrappy, Trillville, anybody, man, it becomes anarchy in the club. Yes. You know why? There's two words that we created that most forever trending sound does. It's nostalgia and euphoria. Nostalgia and euphoria creates a good time and a time when you can remember. That's what it was. So when you, so when you or anybody else start giving me uh, analogies of these records, you'd be like, man, I remember when you just said it. To this day, man, they call that the band glorious uh, segment. Man, I remember, remember. That's that's what our parents had. That's what their parents had with music. And I think that the kids, and I'm working with a lot of kids, and that's the first thing I tell kids. I say, listen, if you're not building nostalgia and euphoria in your fan base, you're not going to be able to sustain your lifestyle because your fans have to remember a time and know why they remembered it. If they don't remember it, they don't get a good feeling every time they hear it. They're going to be like, it don't really mean that much to them. You know, and that's that's the key to this. Like, if your music makes people feel like that years later, you can eat. You can eat. You can do shows. You can do Vegas. You can do this. You can do that. And everybody goes up and down. doesn't matter who you is. You know, you can be the number one guy today and tomorrow you're nobody. Right? So, but what keeps you going is your music. Your energy, your vibe, what you put out there to people, that's what makes people enjoy you. And they love you for it. They be like, man, you don't realize what you got me through, Bone Man, when I was in jail, dog. That song got me through being in solitary. Man, I was sick. I mean, this guy told me, man, something. He said, man, I was in solitary confinement, bro. And the only thing that got me through was just singing your hook and your verse through, the, through my whole time in there. I was like, bro, that is crazy. Crazy. He said, man, you don't know what you mean. He started crying, bro. And that to mm. me was just like heart. <clears throat> I had to give him a hug and said, bro, come on in here for the real thing, man. Come on in here, bro. That's real, man. And I yeah. I get stories like that all the time where people are saying, hey man, you don't realize what that record did for my life, man. You don't realize, man, me, me being a big guy and you taking your shirt off, man, getting crazy, man. That meant so much to me, man. You helped me. You helped me become a better person, man. You helped me, blah, blah, this, that. I'm just like, man, I I really appreciate that, man. That's That, to me, is more important than any of my accolades, getting nominated for this, winning this, and all that. That means absolutely nothing to me. As long as people are feeling good and getting through their problems, their strife, their pain, they, their, their whatever they're going through, that is the award. That's when you, you, you are on a whole nother face. That's what it's all about, man. So to your point, 
that's what Crump meant to me, that people were getting through bad times and what they were feeling at that moment, man. People were really struggling and trying to figure out where hip hop was going at that point because of all the things that were going on, man. And, and Crump saved hip hop in its own little way. It helped save hip hop. I totally agree. Boom. I have to let another one of my coworkers get on here, but I want to say thank you for your time. Thank no problem, you for man. the jury. Th thank you for the jury. Thank you for being a lyrical giant, man. And, and as long as I got this platform, bro, it's always open to you, Bone, man. I appreciate you, dog. Man, I appreciate you, brother. Much love, man. Wait for next year. The Lyrical Giant will return. I want to interview when the album drop, Bone. Give me that. That's your word. I got you. Oh, team, John! Indeed. <laughs> Peace out, Bone. Love, bro. Enjoy your weekend. Peace.